Hello and welcome to The Next Rung, the University of Chichester's career podcast. I'm Sam. I'm here today with Matt um, from Inner Drive. Um, could you tell us a bit about, uh, you know, a bit about yourself just in general before we start? Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Matt Shaw. Um, I studied both my undergrad and my master's um, at Chichester. I did sport and exercise psychology for both kind of three years straight into my one year uh, and then from there went went out and started working in the field went on to what we call um, our stage two qualification which is another you know two to four years um, and now I'm a chartered sport and exercise psychology uh, psychologist and I work for a company called um, called Inner Drive. Fantastic and, and what what is it uh, what is it Inner Drive specialised in? Yeah so so really we're a psychology company and we work across a few different uh, domains if you like one of them uh, obviously is sports where i'm really the lead sports psychologist in our team um, we also work in business and in education as well um, and really what we try and do is we try and take what we know from psychology and try and make it make sense basically kind of we see ourselves largely as like a human google translate if you like um in the there's lots of stuff that we know out there lots of theory lots of research but often it's not disseminated very well so we try and kind of fill that gap um and then of course we do lots of one-to-one sport with um a range of clients from um olympic medalists senior international footballers um kind of all the way down through through the rungs if you like as well Mm. oh fantastic so um in terms of like your where you are at the minute and the, and the path you've taken um how is your how's your degree helped because obviously you said you've done a master's and an undergraduate here as well yeah. um how has your degree kind of helped you on that path would you have been able to do it without the degree no so like there's no way i'd have been able to do it without my degree i, I guess there's a few few ways of looking at it. first is you have to have the qualifications of course under your belt to be able to do it and i know that when i was looking at studying sports psychology as a whole and perhaps maybe going into the field afterwards i guess you never really know at a level um mm-hmm. but when i was just looking at trying to go into it i know that um Chichester was one of the first ones to be accredited so that kind of brought my attention towards it so that's the crucial bit is that i was able to do my undergrad and my masters which counts as your stage one if you like to becoming um a chartered psychologist and then uh, that set me up perfectly to be able to move into my stage two qualification so there's the first element is it's physically impossible to become a psychologist without doing those two stages um but then there's all the skills you get along the way so you know often when i reflect on um what are some of those things outside of you know the grades etc that has allowed me to work in the industry and i look at other people be it trainees in my team who are really good and coming through and i and i look at you know what is it that we perhaps have in common is some of the softer skills that you learn at university um i think chichester is perfect for a lot of those um not only because we had relatively small cohorts which meant that actually your input was a massive part of the qualification. So you might be one tenth of the cohort, which particularly in masters, which means your input's huge to how everyone else does as well. So there's that element of accountability and responsibility, but also the relationships. You know, I'm still really close with a handful of my lecturers from my masters. And this is, you know, almost five years on from finishing my masters. And I was at the cricket the other week with one of them. Uh, another one of my lecturers supervised me. Jenny Smith was brilliant, supervised me through my stage two and, and was one of my lecturers in my undergrad. I'm really close to another lecturer, That's Phil it. Birch, who's still there as well. So, you know, it, it creates an environment where you have ongoing support outside of your qualification, but you learn a lot of those soft skills, be it communication, listening, empathy, actually what it's like to be in the room with a, you know, a hypothetical athlete that we were doing lots of in our masters. So there's all those elements that you pick up and often, you know, when I'm on the other side of the desk now interviewing candidates for for roles, sometimes I see those skills missing where they haven't had that environment that's allowed those skills to flourish through their through their qualification. I mean, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head there because I was going into the old chat about soft skills and you've you've hit it right on the head and spotted it coming. Um, but it, it's interesting you talk there about, you know, uh, interviewing candidates not seeing them have those soft skills. Have you, uh, have you noticed that kind of shift and the inevitable question post-COVID? Have you seen that shift in, in soft skills? Yeah, I, I think so. We, we often see a range. So, so sometimes we see candidates that have it all, have the academic background and the ability to apply what they've learned to real life situations, which is obviously great. 
but particularly at my company what we're always looking for like we can teach people that what we're always looking for is you know in your interview can you show us that if we put you in front of an athlete they're going to like you and think yeah matt's i can trust matt at least and matt's a nice guy or you know um at, at my company you have to do a presentation as part of your interview and within two three minutes you can tell straight away if someone's even comfortable doing presentations if someone um has presented before if they have that you know uh, that approach where it's not really rigid and and, and as academic and I, I look back at my masters um and we used to do presentations pretty much every week and at the time i'd sit there and think why are we doing presentations every week you know you'd much rather sit there and just absorb information rather than being the one disseminating it but i look back now and i think i'm so glad i did that because that's what allowed me to do well in my interview straight out of my masters and i haven't looked back since and has allowed me to flourish i think in the role since whereas we look at a lot a lot of candidates who don't get the opportunity to do that at university for a range of reasons you know other universities are great at things but particularly just we're good at getting the chance to do that and have feedback and be in the room with your supervisors and your lecturers who you know i remember when i um got my interview for the job I currently have or have grown into, if you like, five years ago. And it was whilst I was handing my master's dissertation in. And I remember talking to my lecturers at the time about, you know, do you have any advice for me? Can I do this? And actually going through the presentation that I had to present with them, yeah. you know, it was a massive help as part of the reason I got the role in the first place. And, and I think that support is is crucial. Uh, and like you say, around um, the close, um, you know, the softer communication type skills. Yeah, I've definitely seen us. Uh, a bit of a drop off partly because everything went online for a while but even before that you know if you don't practice those skills you're not going to be good at them particularly under pressure in an interview or a role play type situation and it's quite easy to tell you know if people have practiced listening and really listening to people and understanding and asking good questions and making people feel warm and comfortable mm -hmm. um well, yeah, we, we, we see that. We see that a lot of the time. And that's one of the things I, I look back now. And not only me, some of the, my colleagues, if you like, that were on my pathway. I know I know a handful of people that were at Chichester with me who went into the field afterwards who will always look back and say, that's the reason they do quite well. Academically, they may not have been the best in the room, but you can bet that they'll be one of the people in the room that makes athletes or coaches feel comfortable. And, and that's how that's how you get into the field. Being, being personal, I suppose, just being, yeah, a, a, a nice person. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, I mean, it's, yeah, you mentioned there about um, like the support that you'd had along the way. Um, who was there like some key some key moment for you that like epitomised the level of support you got at, you know, during your degree or? Yeah, I, I think there's probably a range of points um, that I've spoken to my lecturers about since as well, like since having been there and we kind of laugh and joke about it, I think. <laughs> I was like most first year students where, you know, you're not necessarily living for lectures, you're living for everything else um, yeah. and probably really just needed someone to take me under their wing and say, come on, mate, you're not going to do well if this is the case. And a lot of my lecturers say to me now, you know, the shift between me and first year and second year was and then second year to third year was kind of monumental. Um, and the reason for that is because of the handful of lecturers that I had, both my academic advisors and my course lecturers, who, mm. who essentially said, what, what are you playing at? You know, you've got loads to offer here and this is really good and this is really good. And, you know, w without that, I probably would have got lost a little bit, at, particularly at a bigger <laughs> university with higher student numbers. I think it'd be really easy to just kind of drop off and kind of stay under the radar, whereas they made me you know, flourish in, in that sense. And, and then from there, once you develop that relationship, you know, I can look at pretty much all of my lectures on the course that I had at, for a range of different reasons, be it, you know, lectures that are there now, lectures that aren't there anymore. And I can look at lectures that, you know, helped me personally and, and away from academics, lectures that kind of took me under their wing and helped be it my undergrad dissertation, be it my master's dissertation, be it on particular modules where I was struggling and, you know, the door was always open for a tutorial to go in and, and chat to them. And then there's lectures that, you know, kind of have have both pieces of that for you for some reason or another. There's lectures that you click with um, more and, and they'll know who they are that either supervise you through the process or, you know, you look back now and you probably consider them a mate rather than a lecturer. And yeah. I think by the time most of my cohort agrees with me, by the time we're on our masters, you know, although you know they're, you know, they're, they're professional and, and really experienced at what they do, you have that kind of pally type feel to it where, you know, you, you're an adult and they treat you like that and, uh, 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 and thus you create really good relationships. So is that something that, looking back on, you said about in first year you were 
doing you you were extending the freshers week maybe into a bit longer. Yeah. Um, like, what would you? This is the you know the typical question. If you could go back and tell yourself something, what would you have done, or what would you have done differently? Yeah, I, I think just engaged with the process a bit more and engaged with my lecturers earlier because I look back and I think, wow, since say second year, third year onwards, the amount I've gained academically but also personally from my lecturers, if I'd done that in the first year, it would have set me up for the whole thing really. And I, I never really look back and think I could have done better academically. I mean, I, I did okay. I did well in my undergrad and, and in my master's and have ended up in, in, in a decent job. But I think, you know, the earlier you engage with that, the better, because there's no reason not to. The, the support's yeah. there. I think what we're quite, what we have that's quite unique at Chichester, just certainly through 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 my experience, is that support mm -hmm. and the access to support, be it, you know, through your tutors, your lecturers, academic advisors. I remember going to, um, um, like study support for the first time to help me write essays better through I think it was through Sears and then booked book, booked elsewhere and it kind of blew my mind a little bit that you could make such quick changes that but that I hadn't been taught because I hadn't engaged with it um, and then didn't look back there I was probably the most annoying guy in there every week trying to get support for writing essays because I thought you know it's there and actually lots of my friends that I'd grown up with who had gone to other universities didn't have that support every week um, or, or, or every month if you like so I kind of made, made as much use of that as possible. So I think the earlier you engage with these things, the better and almost feel lucky in a sense that that, that support was there for you because it means that you don't kind of get washed out and, and stay under the radar. You, you're able to, to flourish in your own way. Yeah, I mean, that kind of self-driven self -driven engagement is quite, it can be quite difficult, I'm sure, as a psychologist, <laughs> you know, dealing with that, very, very well aware of that. So um, what do you... Yeah, in terms of your your qualification stuff, you've obviously got a masters and undergrad, which is you know great. Where do you do you see your career path coming back to academia at some point, or do you see yourself staying kind of in the private sector and working there? Like, is there some you know with your experience of of being an undergraduate and and studying, do you want to kind of reflect your best practices back on people, or what? Yeah, what's it's kind of that like? it's. It's an interesting one to think about because, yeah, it, it is interesting. I, I'd like to think that at some point I'd get back into academia a bit more. I think sometimes they seem like quite different worlds. Um, Pre-COVID and, and actually during some of the lockdowns, I was associate lecturing um, at Chichester. So I did a bit for undergrad, did a bit for masters on their applied practice course as well. Um, and I really enjoyed it, that kind of almost felt like going full circle that I was where they were a couple of years prior had been in the field to learn this stuff for myself and find my own nuance and, and, and techniques and experience to then report back with some of that research so I really enjoyed kind of closing that loop yeah um, but I think for now I'm quite happy in the in, in the applied world but but like any course I think you need practitioners to end up back in academia to keep that feedback circle with nothing else going so I'd like to think that I'd end up there one day and and I really enjoyed lecturing through Chichester as well because I was able to offer what I loved so much about education which was you know I was coming into albeit these groups hadn't seen me before I was kind of this random guy that was turning up but um small groups lots of workshop based stuff did some experiments with the students had those close conversations about what it looks like to be in the field and what I see day to day and you know it was able to offer them hypothetical situations that I'd been in recently and let them solve those problems so being able to do that would be brilliant again um, and whether that's through lecturing again whether that's going coming back and trying to complete um, a PhD. Um, mm -hmm. There is a research element through the stage two that we have to do, which is doctoral level. So I've kind of done that bit and I'm quite happy taking a break for that for now. Um, but I can't see why I wouldn't come back, especially to Chichester anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, yeah, it sounds like you've got, you've definitely got the potential to, you know, to do, to do the PhD and stuff. But what, uh, so in terms of your job at the minute then, uh, how would that would that benefit you if you got a PhD? Would it sort of elevate you to a, a higher pay grade or something, or, or would you just think the experience would be the most useful part? Um, I, I think it would largely be the experience, if I'm honest. I, I, I think it would help in some senses having done it, maybe to mm -hmm. open some doors to be able to 
to meet other people and you know during some of the research that i was doing that i my first piece that we published was my master's piece that i published with some of my lectures we've just submitted another piece to publish as well through my lectures as well which is just, uh, um and that's been brilliant to be able to meet other practitioners out there uh and talk to a range of athletes about a range of themes as well so that, that's been a really helpful bit i think you know in some senses some of my footballers that I work with wouldn't know necessarily what a PhD is and thus probably wouldn't care if I had a PhD or not that what they're really interested in is you know can I turn up to their house or FaceTime them or, or whatever it might be and offer sound advice but yeah. sometimes be the adult in the room that really listens and understands some of the issues that they're having um, or maybe it's not even about having issues it's just wanting a chat and knowing that that's not going to get back to the press or whatever it might be um, yeah. and in that sense I probably they're probably not as interested in, in in my academic qualifications more interested in those soft skills that i was able to develop at the uni anyway um but but maybe i it's interesting the job market sometimes there's look there's lots of people now that do professional doctorates who get both the applied experience and the phd piece and that seems like a quite a viable route these days so i i guess it's just what people want i wanted to get out there and be a practitioner first and then maybe come backwards um towards academia some people prefer to stay in academia lecture and then move into applied practice you know it, it really is courses for courses um um but yeah, it would benefit me in some ways. I think in, in in some other ways, I think, you know, while I'm still relatively young anyway and have very little responsibility, I quite like spending all the hours I can with my clients or working on ways to help people learn better is one of the big things that we do in a drive. So um, I'm kind of firmly focused on that at the moment. Yeah, no, I, that's interesting. You said about, you know, going and working with your um, football football clients and stuff. So it just makes me think what what are the kind of best bits about your job you know working with people in uh in the well i don't know i don't know which levels of football you're working with them at but you know what uh what are the kind of best bits about your job yeah so some of the best bits are because we work one-to-one -one, we're not we don't embed ourselves in the club we used to work on that model we don't do anymore um because we work purely one-to-one -one and thus are kind of on the outside, if you like, that that creates probably some of the best bits and the worst bits. Because I think some some people that I know that work at clubs have brilliant access, are on site, on the grass all day, and that that lifestyle's got to be brilliant. Um, but they have slight, uh, slightly other pr uh, pressures around, you know, being able to work with large groups of people all at once. Whereas, you know, relatively speaking, I get to pick and choose who our clients are um because we don't have to take people on as a business we take most people on but we get to my, at my level now i can kind of pick and choose the athletes i work with which means that largely it's if there's some really nice work to be done can see it being a really good relationship so that's a really good bit i quite like the the idea of kind of being in the background and i know that you know if they're performing well or performing poorly i'll probably be the first person to find out from them um i quite like knowing that i'm the guy that they'll text in the changing room or straight after for example about whatever's happened out there uh, and knowing that you're kind of the person in their team that as the psych in the team i largely see as i'm one of the people that don't want anything from them they're surrounded and this isn't just my footballers you know i've worked in athletics um i've had race drivers before as well and it's kind of like you're the one person that doesn't actually want anything from that relationship you're you're there to help and that's quite unique to them because most people around them want something from them in in some form um so that that presents the the cool bit the, the bit i love the most the bit that could be can be frustrating sometimes is of course you should never really live on that emotional roller coaster with them but it's tough when they don't perform well um and there's always an element of reflection and introspection around you know could i have done every anything better and sometimes it's not nice talking to athletes who you know have trained for years and years and years let's say olympic cycles and then don't perform at olympic cycles you're part of that process with them so it can be really horrible when they don't perform well and and it and you know people will say that you shouldn't take it personally but it's difficult not, not to take it personally and ultimately we're dealing with other people who have worked really hard towards something and it hasn't quite come off and it doesn't matter what domain you're in if one of your friends works really hard towards something and it doesn't come off and then they're kind of down about it for ages it's horrible it's a horrible place to be so some of the best things are also the worst things in that sense because you have such a close relationship it can go both ways mm -hmm. um so, so that's pretty cool and you know i work with a really good team at inner drive um we've been through well since i've been there we, obviously we went through covid together and we've come out the other side and expanded quite rapidly since i think our team's probably uh almost quadrupled since wow. since covid so um that's been really awesome is that you know i'm part of a company where i have um 
a large amount of input and impact mm-hmm. uh, and I'm now developing a team underneath me who are brilliant young practitioners who are training as well so able to kind of give something back in that sense as well because I think that lots of sports sciences or, or, or lots of jobs can be quite lonely places anyway particularly if you're working by yourself a lot so being able to be part of a team where when I was training I could learn and thrive under them and now I can teach new things to practitioners who hadn't necessarily seen what it's like before is is a really cool place to be. Mm, no that's fantastic that's really interesting um, uh, yeah the uh, the connection with the, your clients is a very it's a very delicate one I suppose it's not like it, when you when you talk about it, it just reminded me of the typical thing with uh, lawyers and attorney attorney client privilege. You know? Yeah, just having that very personal connection with them where you where you can't share it um, is really interesting. Um, yeah, it's quite um it's quite a privilege in some senses that you know often people share things with you that they won't tell their family or their friends. Mm. They definitely won't be telling their managers, teammates because of you know fear of selection, for example. So in that sense, it's quite you end up in quite a privileged position. But often that could be quite a predicament depending on what they tell you and how they tell you what it what it actually means um but yeah, i see it largely as a privilege yeah no no fantastic and so in terms of like you mentioned about uh you're developing a team there are you with your experience with chichester are you are you trying to curry students in from chichester into your team or yeah so we have um we have offered placements in uh, but before sometimes they don't necessarily fit with the demands or you know the, the academic demands from Chichester sometimes you know the, it doesn't quite work but we're always looking and I'm always looking as, as an employer at um, students that come from Chichester just likewise you know I get so many emails from potential students saying where should I go what should I look for which you know I try not to tell people exactly what to do but I'm always yeah. pointing them towards Chichester anyway um, and, and, and there's a number of students that come out through the master's program or then into stage two from Chichester that I always talk to about you know what can they do next what does it look like and if I can't offer them a job where could they get a job and we're always looking you know I will always be quite biased anyway but I know my boss for example always says that the quality of student that comes out of Chichester is brilliant because he's seen it in me and a number of my colleagues that um, have either worked freelance for us from Chichester or come on and done some more permanent stuff and have now ended up in in other roles around the country so we're Mm. we're always on the lookout Um, but you know a big part of what we do at my company away from sport probably the biggest part of what my company as a whole does is where we work in education and we go in and teach um, either staff about, you know, how to learn, how to learn more or how students learn memory, metacognition, Mm -hmm. kind of cognitive load, some of these key principles from psychology, or we might teach students things in workshops. Um, And and some of the candidates we get from Chichester are brilliant at doing that because of the public speaking element. Um, And given that's such a fundamental part of what our business does and what my role has been in in the past and some of my colleagues' roles are now, um, we're always on the lookout, yeah. Yeah, I know, fantastic. Um, I guess then we'll kind of, uh, we'll we'll wrap up with a fun little question, which we, you know, have done most of the other interviews on, to, to kind of place where you were when you were at university and it's either you know a song that su- sort of summarized your time at university or was in the charts but i think in your case it would make sense uh, to ask you um who were the big footballers at your time at university who were the, the ones you couldn't stop hearing about uh, um so there were a number of uh footballing moments anyway that I think of when I think of uni it kind of associated with that so I'm a massive Chelsea fan and I think it was in my first year I remember sitting in Stockbridge uh, in my flat watching Chelsea City as Lampard had signed for City and scored the winning goal against Chelsea um, which I was uh, absolutely (laughs) gutted and obviously took a bit uh, took a bit of cop for that as well Um, so I remember that quite clearly and I also remember um I remember very clearly the World Cup Trippier's free kick as well um, when I was in town watching that. Are kind of the things that are, I associate massively with with my time at university. But kind of just adds to it, just some brilliant times with some brilliant people in such a in such a nice environment. Um, there, I think they're the two moments that probably stand out most for me. To be honest, is um, is in, in first year and then watching the World Cup in town um, with, with a group of mates that you know you've been mates with for years. Um, they're definitely the two the two that stick out to me. Definitely some interesting psychology behind those moments. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. No problem. No problem. And um, yeah, well, see you later. Awesome. Thanks very much. Yeah. So um, 
So that was really interesting. Um, Matt had obviously lots to say and lots of, sort of different, really interesting points. What were your main takeaways, Sam? I mean, he seems very successful in his in his position. It sounds like he's really, uh, really invested in the psychology of it all and really mm. enjoys working with clients. Uh, it just sounds like a really rewarding job. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's really interesting because I, I, one thing I picked up uh, about it, I think it's really the value of finding the right company for you mm. uh, because uh, not all companies are the same. Um, even in the same field and that do sort of similar things, or offer similar services or create similar products. Um, he was sort of saying that a lot of sports psychology companies will work with the whole team. I was just thinking that, yeah. Um, whereas in a drive, work one to one mm. with with the athlete, um, and and obviously that would create quite different working environments for mm. sports psychologists. Um, and some people would prefer that working with the entire club or team yeah. or whatever it is, or and others prefer to work on that one-to-one basis and, and sort of work just with that athlete and from that team and then maybe another athlete from a different team. Um, and he obviously really enjoys what he does. It would be interesting, would he enjoy it as much if he worked in another type of environment where he worked with a whole team? Maybe not, whereas somebody else might prefer that. So it's, it's really important to think about yeah. which company you go and work with as well. It's, it, yeah, because you've talked about the presentation skills, which mm. obviously you're delivering to a, a large number mm. of people, but that mm. doesn't necessarily mean that you're able to deliver, because you know, even if you're a psychologist for a, for a group of people, you can't deliver tailored advice necessarily well mm. to a group of people, whereas yeah. you can deliver it one-to-one. Yes, so, exactly. yeah. Yeah, so there's obviously pros and cons of, of, of both in terms of the working environment. Um, and what you said about uh, presentation skills, that's something that Matt was talking about as well. And, and this is an interesting point. He was talking about um, having certain skills and qualifications, but actually some companies, what's more important to them is that you're somebody who can work well within that team and you fit well into that team. And that's not uncommon to hear from employers. Then. Mm. Obviously, skills and qualifications are important, and you're not going to get hired without them. Yeah. But equally, somebody who on paper maybe has more than somebody else doesn't necessarily mean they're definitely going to get the job no. if they don't demonstrate that they're the right person to fit into that team. Yeah. Um, you know, and he talked about um, presentation skills as one of those things, but also just being a nice person yeah. that's easy to work with. Being personable is, yeah. is so uh, so important because if you're yeah. just, you know, if you're very uh, difficult with your colleagues, mm. then, well, mm. you're probably just not going to... No, gonna and that's obviously yeah. going to cause fractions within the team and, and therefore mean that that working team is not going to be as productive as it could be. Mm. Um, so it is important to be somebody who's easy to work with for that, for that reason. Um, yeah, um, I mean, did you have any other other points that you wanted to? to no, I to? I thought it was funny him um, seething about uh, City and Chelsea. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. It was interesting that he picked two because obviously he mentioned Trippier's free kick in the World Cup semi final. Mm. Started well, didn't end so well for England. So it's interesting that he picked two men. <laughs> I was <laughs> just thinking. I wonder if he was thinking about the psychology in perhaps. in Trippier's head at that moment. But mm, no, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> um, the one other interesting point uh, that I wanted to talk about that, that he raised was his awareness that you know he's really happy with what he's doing at the moment, um, and that's what he sees himself doing for the foreseeable mm. future. However, he was aware that maybe in the future his career priorities might change. And he yeah. was talking about maybe one day, not now and not sort of in, in the very near future, but one day going into academia mm. because that's something else he would see value in doing. But he's aware that that's not what he's want, wanting to do yeah. at this moment. It's something that, that might be. And, and it's, it's, I think it's important to be flexible in that yeah. regard in your Absolutely. career because things will change mm. um, and your priorities as a result will change. Whereas if you're really sort of stubborn, and yes, yes, it's fine to sort of have a dream um, and, and, you know, that be an end goal, and if you get there, brilliant. But it's also important to realise that that dream might change. Yeah. I mean, he, he at least has the flexibility that, as he says, he's doing some research, which is a doctoral level. Mm. Um, so he, and he has a master's mm. qualification, so he, he could, in theory, just be able to drift back into academia yeah. with relative ease. Mm. But, yeah, there's that... 
the, the ability to move between um, uh, career paths like that is, is useful, but the fact that he's got an open mind to it all is even more useful. And the other element of that flexibility is, I think, you know, flexibility and resilience kind of go hand in hand. Mm. And if you're not flexible and then something that you're not expecting happens that sort of throws you off, yeah. then that could be quite a challenge to deal with. Whereas if you are aware that things are going to change and external factors perhaps, or even internal factors will, will cause that, then you're going to be more able to adapt to those circumstances. Energy. All psychology, really. <laughs> yes, it is all psychology. Awesome. Well, thanks, Sam. No pleasure. Um, and we'll see you for the next one.